All right. Um, hope everybody's doing okay. We got four more lectures to do for range management. Uh, obviously, I'm not working as my normal way. This is the weekend. I'm wearing a very high professional sh shirt, telling me, telling everybody how I'm dealing with uh, coronavirus. Okay, part of multiple use, you might recall, has, has a lot to do with trying to grow more than one product, provide society with more than one thing on the same property. And on federal lands, it's impossible to do all of them necessarily on, on, on um, the same acre. You can't do wildlife, all wildlife, timber production, et cetera. And so there's, there's a give and take. Uh, we are land rich in this country, so we have been able to separate some of these uh, land uses. Uh, and so we can have just pastures and grassland and timber. Other parts of the world cannot. Uh, so this is one of those uh, examples of how we kind of do a multiple use. Reaching out to how the world does it and bringing a application that's fairly unique to the United States. And this is uh, agroforestry. Uh, where it's obviously an agricultural trees working together on the same property. And the more specific uh, approach I'm going to talk about is civil pasture, where you are growing trees and, uh, and a forage crop uh, with the idea of pop hay or cattle on the same property. So our traditional model in the United States is the forests are forests, pastures are lives, and livestock are in a separate box, and then the cropland are in a, a third box. But the rest of the world doesn't necessarily do it this way. They'll have a row of trees with crops in between, uh, crops of some kind of in between the trees, uh, or more likely they're going to have a livestock grazing in a forest situation. Uh, much like we would have seen historically in the United States in our western forests like Ponderosa Pine and Southern Rockies or the Longleaf Pine of the southeast of the United States. So what you're doing here in agroforestry, or uh, specifically civil pasture, and I'll use those terms interchangeably here, is to integrate the technologies and the approaches we have in forestry. At the same time, we're going to go to uh, look at these things from an agricultural standpoint blending them together. Now from a private land standpoint, this is an economic diversification. It's not putting all your eggs in one basket. It is an attempt to say, I look at, I've got some things that can provide me annual income. I've got other items that can provide me an income occasionally. Put them together so I have a, a economic income stream flow that allows me to have really good years when I take advantage of this other alternatives rather than just one annual crop. Now traditionally, we look at forestry and we'll do something like this. And this is one approach that we can have. This is a plantation going through, cutting down trees. Here they are uh, thinning out a plantation, taking out rows of trees in the middle. This is the world that here at Forestry Hill that we're used to dealing with all the time. This is the other world, okay? This is the world of ag ag uh, agriculture and uh, animal science where you don't like the trees and you have uh, the cattle out there in the open eating uh, grass, etc. So this is the world of the two boxes that I've been talking about. What happens when you bring these two together? And I've been using the uh, some pictures from the uh, uh, hill farm experiment station where there is some, some long-term silviculture uh, demonstration areas and research areas and some of the slides I have in here are coming from those uh, showing that you can do both uh, and, and do it well from a sustainability standpoint. Now here's what agroforestry does. It's a productive system because it's integrated. It brings you money it provides a healthy income and a healthy uh, environment. And it's also sustainable, which is part of the natural resource mantra we want to have. It, but it takes those four pieces to make it a commercial land use production system. So it is not something that you would necessarily just say, OK, I've got some trees, throw some cows out there, and say, OK, this is what I got. It's not that kind of uh, management. 
And in fact, some people would say that this is actually more intensive approach to land management in a grazing system than the savory method is, which we talked about for the second test. Because this one, unlike just forest land grazing, well, I just let my cows wander around uh, in the woods, is that it's an intentional management system. There's integration, it's interactive, and it is intensive. And it requires the eyes, because you as a landowner, or if I'm speaking on, as, as a landowner, I have to do all of those things. So we change things a little bit. For, instead of the traditional plantation management that we see in, in forest situations, now we have to arrange the trees so there's an optimum timber and forage growth uh, opportunity. So you're doing two. You're going to try have to at the same time minimize production costs because now other things have to be happening other than plant trees in rows and wait nine years before you do something else. And you have to include with that the acceptability, accessibility, excuse me, of the equipment that you are, are dealing with. And that's another important component. There's some equipment that, it, that has to be incorporated into this system and you are going to have to account for its maneuverability in, in this kind of system. So example, the most traditional way that we approach uh, silvopasture in the United States, especially in the southeastern United States, is that we start in a pasture setting. Uh, right around 90% of the uh, establishment of a silvopasture system in the southeastern United States is created in this way. So here you've got it at Hill Farm, uh, you've got this uh, pasture, you've got a healthy grass component. So what did they do here? They spray banded herbicide where you're going to plant the trees and then they actually rip the terrain up, breaking up the compaction that was caused by the livestock over decades of pasture management uh, to allow more water to get in there. Then we also have the idea that once the seedlings in the ground, apologize for that, um, is that uh, you just can't treat it like you normally would in the pasture. I don't know if you can see, but right in front of that tractor, you can see where the uh, seedling is popping up, uh, about five feet ahead of that uh, the, the operator's left front wheel. And so, in this case, you don't want cattle out there right away, so you're going to uh, uh, cut hay for a few years, allowing those trees to get up above where they could be trampled or girdled. And so you are going to need an operator that is not just running up and down cutting hay like you would if there's no other concern out there. You also have to, you may notice the uh, fabric behind it, the burlap. What they're doing is they're making sure that while they're cutting the hay, it doesn't go over too far and smother the seedlings, making it difficult to bale that hay afterwards. So it's, again, a more intensive management approach. So this is a dormant season picture of that same area, but not the same angle. But you can see where in the green area, you can see where the seedlings this one year later uh, are coming up. And, uh, but you can see the open areas in between. Now, if you're a forestry and you look at a picture like this, you say, whoa, this is way too wide. You're wasting all that space. Remember, what you have to do is have the arrangement here so that sunlight can sit there, uh, come down, and support the herbaceous vegetation, where in a plantation, you just want the trees to capture that sunlight. So now we're going to spread them out, wider spacing, maybe 28, 30, up to 36, even 40 in some cases, feet between rows, and then have one or two rows of trees in this. This is a single row uh, approach in this case. Uh, there you see the seedlings are coming up, and a couple years later you can then, it's not the same site by the way, uh, you can put cattle out there. At this point, any damage the cattle can do to your tree seedlings is minimal, uh, and, but the management here is that is they'll leave the trees alone because it's not very palatable food as long as there is adequate forage uh, on the ground. So you've got to maintain that grass and herbaceous component at the same time. Now the other approach, which isn't used very often, but it is possible, and that is the idea. You start from a tr uh, plantation standpoint and cut down to uh, 
a, a situation where you uh, have tr trees, trees in rows, and the trees may be following a, a previous uh, situation where you had a plantation and you just cut thin down more than you would every third or fifth row, you're thinning down four out of five or five out of six. The, or the other thing is, if it's a natural stand, what you can do is just create artificial rows, and it's not an exact line, but it's pretty close. That's the approach we're taking out at the, uh, at the beef farm on the addition where we are creating on the north side, where we are creating a civil pasture uh, whenever we get back to operation uh, in that property. So you have that, then you gotta do some site prep. We got fire as a tool trying to get rid of down woody material, young trees, woody material, oaks, and etc. You might have to do a little bit of disking. This is a lot of disking. Uh, the damage to the roots here was dramatic. But it's the idea is that you are going to have to break this up a little bit um, and to allow you to uh, spread grass seed. Uh, because now you're going to get the uh, establishment of a herbaceous layer underneath these existing species. Your grass species may be totally different than what you do. You're not going to use Bermuda grass very often in a situation like that because it doesn't do very well in, in medium levels of shade or heavier shade. Probably going to have to fertilize. And so we have that. In this case, is actually what you're seeing is a double row on the on the, on the your right and then a single row on the left. And so here you have a picture, and this is again a hill farm, where we have the uh, rows out there. You can see the trees marked. If you look closely at the, uh, I guess it would be about um, 2 o'clock. You look at the clock right near that tree, you see a small uh, exposure there. That was a research site that we had there. Uh, trying to look at what, how much uh, utilization we were getting uh, from the cattle uh, on, that, on that site. <coughs> One of the things that has to, you have to keep in mind is this thing is intensive in the sense that it's going to require you to have uh, more activities. Uh, you just can't treat it like a pine plantation. Because you're opening up that stand and the spacing is wider, these trees are going to uh, Keep their limbs longer. Well, you, uh, you're not going to self prune, so you're going to have to mechanically prune those branches. Uh, in this case, we call that lifting. We're going to lift the canopy up, and then we keep doing that until we run out of the capability of lifting that. Because what you want to do is allow more of that sunlight to get down to this uh, the understory, and lifting those lower branches uh, can help you do that. So here you have a situation where you have rows, but if the branches had not been um, uh, lifted. And so you still have a lot of lower branches um, in this case. The herbicide is still hanging in there pretty well, but you got some pretty fair uh, herbaceous uh, production still going on between the rows. And there you got some happy cows. There's an explosion on the left hand. Probably going to have some, a lot more fencing involved here because you got to move animals around because if you keep them on there to any one paddock or pa pasture too long, what you're going to end up is having some issues with uh, the nibbling on the, on, the, on the terminal buds of the branches or causing some damage to the trees themselves. Water becomes an issue here. This is also at the Hill Farm Experiment Station in Homer, Louisiana. And what they did is they put piped in water, because they weren't a huge uh, operational unit, but they were able to set up so you could have water available uh, for, at one point for two pastures, and it was working fairly well. And there's a, a herd that was at, uh, at Homer uh, moving around. Okay, these are this is old data, but this, I want to kind of give an example of how this plays out economically. Um, and I stole this slide set from an NRCS publication a number of years ago, a presentation at a meeting. So we've got these uh, livestock prices, uh, whatever they are right now, you see them going up and down. Uh, so this is where this diversification comes in. What is the 
income stream going to feel like? What is the result going to be of going to a civil pasture case type setting? One research that was done uh, looking at the weaning weight of, of calves, uh, SP is civil pasture, OP is open pasture, and uh, LR and HR are uh, low rates and high rates of fertilizer. And you can see that, uh, that the, the uh, weaning weight after 205 days were listed there on the right hand side. And there's no statistically different uh, result here uh, between the 537 and high rate of fertilizer and the 507 low rate versus the 52518. Uh, but the difference is there's no statistically different, these are average numbers with a lot of variation. Between animals, if you can get this kind of non-significant differences, but it, but in nine years, ten years, twenty years, thirty years, you get the value of the, uh, the timber production off of that too. There's some gain there economically. Pulp wood prices, I don't even know where they are right now. Here I am, late March of 2020, and I'm not going to pretend to know where they are. I think it's probably plummeted right now because. Demand. They're going to go up and then we've got to have toilet paper, apparently. But there's a lot of things going on here. Now, what's important here is what the civil pasture attempt is, is to avoid the lowest income type of timber product that we can get. And that is the pulpwood, the stuff that's used for paper of one form or another. That gets you less than a chip and saw, a saw timber telephone poles. Those are increasing value of per tree basis. And what we're trying to do in silk pasture is avoid this. This is what we are trying to replace with essentially cattle and livestock production. Saw timber prices jumped up and down, but now we're combining here. So let me show you some examples. This again was a study out at uh, Homer, Louisiana. Old, old way, but a cord of wood is a, essentially what you want to talk about is eight feet long, four feet tall, four feet deep. And, um, and so you can see if you produce at age 21, this is total fiber production, you see the 1,300, 100. Look at the quartz per acre that's coming off. It's a matter of geometry. You, you only have so much resources, so you can have a lot of smaller trees, or you can have fewer, bigger trees. You see the numbers that's coming off of these things. What's happening is that when you go from 1,000 to 300 trees per acre, we are shifting that resource towards the larger size trees, which means the higher value product. Okay. Here's what I mean. Quartz per acre, 32, 425 board feet per acre. For the, uh, excuse what we're talking about, a board foot is a piece of wood that's 12 inches by 12 inches by one inch tall. Then look what happened if you shift that, the cords per acre goes down from 32 to 26, but your board feet per acre goes up from 425 to 26, 40. Reduce it even further, you're shifting it into more board feet. Your production of the high value stuff is going up. Cords per acre, which is your pulp wood, is going down. And you can see that playing out. So basically what happens is that if you go somewhere between 300 and 100 trees per acre, which is not an unusual uh, number to have in a civil pasture setting, you are shifting your volume to saw timber somewhere between a, a third to 80 some percent of your uh, total volume that's being produced. And then you can start seeing that was a number, uh, maybe at $300 per thousand board feet, you can see how that plays out. So it does does help you a great deal. If you stretch that on a little bit to a 35 year rotation, and when you start on 35 years, we are talking about now things like uh, telephone poles, which is the highest value product. You can see the total year yield, uh, 900 trees per acre and 100 trees per acre is the same. But what we've done is shift to that again to a very high number, going from 300 to 100 trees per acre, if you are growing at that, say, doubles essentially the 
totally yield the board fee that you get. So this is where the alternatives come into play. We're using the internal rate of uh, return comparison. Uh, if you liquidate the land, sell it off as just property, you can see where it's about 7.3% uh, internal rate of return, timber 8.5, pasture sales 6.4. But look what's happened if you combine some timber with pasture, 12.1. Uh, it's not additive, otherwise that would be 14.9, but it's, but it's more than either one of the other options if you just went just timber or pasture. So, when you look at uh, civil pasture settings, you're talking about a very uh, financially successful, stable production levels, uh, environmentally sensitive, very great for that purpose, and it's sustainable. You can run this, uh, cut down the trees, plant the trees in the same row, you got the herbaceous level already in there, and you do it again. Here's some other areas where it comes into a uh, possible advantage. Fertilizers are expensive, especially petrochemical uh, commercial fertilizers. A lot of land is, is deficient in phosphorus. A great source of phosphorus is chicken litter. So integrating another part of our agricultural economy is collecting the, the uh, chicken litter uh, and distributing in a forested situation. Here's the advantage. If you just put it in a pasture, like a lot of people do, next to chicken houses, that, ought, that can become saturated. You have too much phosphorus, and it'll leach through the soil and get into the groundwater. Tree roots are deeper. And so there's trees will pick up that nutrients that's going through that would get past the herbaceous vegetation. Again, making these trees very productive. They grow faster. In fact, some people think of this loblolly pine, they're actually growing too fast because the quality of wood is a little bit less. They're putting on so much growth per year in some of these cases because they're getting a whole lot of phosphorus, which in our southern coastal plain is a uh, common nutrient deficiency. So if you're getting a deeper rooted plant out there with the main herbaceous crop, and fertilizer rates, whether it's commercial or chicken litter, is at, applied at the rate to support the herbaceous vegetation, which is a higher rate needed than trees. So basically what the trees are getting is a huge amount of extra uh, fertilizer that we never would do if it was a commercial operation. So there we got some uh, chicken litter being spread across. That was again in Louisiana. What about, what about water quality? It's one of the biggest issues, a non-point uh, pollution source in agriculture. In this case, uh, numerous studies have shown that the uh, maintaining a quality uh, water system here with uh, riparian areas without livestock in it, uh, with a civil pasture with, and, and applying a poultry litter as a fertilizer had no negative impact on the water quality that you see right here. It's just like there was no fertilizer applied at all because it, well, it's not leaching into the water. And so what you have to do is also manage uh, for that. And you can see the line there at the base. So basically that little stream in the previous picture is running through that little area right there in the shade. And so it, you fence off the um, the riparian area because you're not using that as a water source. I mentioned there's multiple ways that you can go ahead and uh, apply this uh, trees planting. So this is a single row system. Again, this is that hill farm. Um, by the way, the grass they're growing here is Bahia grass, which does better in the shade than Bermuda grass. Uh, and the cattle don't seem to have a problem with it. This is a system down in southern Mississippi where you have a row of trees growing on there. It's almost what they call a double row. Um, it, but it doesn't look like a plantation with rows because, well, actually, I was where I took the picture. Here's a double row of trees, which now it's wider spacing between the double rows. So you're getting some self pruning from the trees adjacent to each other, so you're mostly having to do any pruning on the outside of these double rows. But this one was set up for a little bit another product. 
What they were doing is putting cattle out there, and then even though they were doing that, they were also cutting for hay once, just before the needles drops in major quantities off these canopies of the trees. Then they were harvesting the pine litter, the needles, and selling it as pine straw. Um, not a whole lot of money, but one additional stream of income that is possible on that. And then they, then they were able to collect that, which, by the way, reduced the uh, soil pH, kept it a little more basic, I should say, not reduced, because if that pine needles were allowed to decompose, they would cause the soils to get more acidic, which means you would have to probably apply lime to get the herbaceous vegetation to grow. In this case, they did not have to do that because picking up the needles reduced that acidity uh, source into the system. There's also another thing about aesthetics. Um, and this has been uh, an interesting approach to some land managers that are, their commercial land base is adjacent to um, uh, uh, inter interface, a wildland urban interface. And so what they do is that uh, having a silver pasture opens it up, uh, which gets uh, much more uh, well-received perception from the public than if it was just a straight plantation with that closed nature. So anyway, that is a very quick uh, example of how we can approach uh, management in a slightly different way. Um, civil pasture, agroforestry combining. Agroforestry incorporates things like the Khan Park on the South End campus it is, it is a, it's essentially a civil pasture, but I mean agroforestry technique, but they had the pecans and we got playground, but they could have been treat, uh, cattle grazing that uh, grass is right there. Uh, windbreaks fall into agroforestry. Um, you can use wildlife. There's uh, some countries use the space between the trees to do, uh, grow flowers, fruiting vines, all this kind of things that can help, uh, again, add economic diversity in your system.